The sun has gone down at Hangman's Hill and the ghost at Misery Corner isn't walking tonight. So, welcome to the Weird Tales Radio Show, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, witchcraft, magic and folklore. And now, here's your host, writer, award-winning journalist, best-selling author and sometime werewolf hunter, Charles Christian. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Weird Tales Radio Show. I'm your host, Charles Christian, and for those of you who keep count, this is episode 82. And among other things, we're going to be talking to one of our favourites, Naomi, for our Minana's Magical Gifts in Norwich, about the autumnal equinox, or Maybon. And we've also got a long spooky tale involving the London underground and cursed mummies. That's Egyptian mummies, as opposed to parents who've had a hard day shopping. You understand? Yes. And we've got plenty of other things as well. But first off, here is Janie, who is going to talk about the most haunted level crossing on the railway system in the UK. Mm -hmm. There really is such a thing. I am. And I'll take you back in time to the 16th of October, 1948. Although it is a recurring halting. And the location is Connington Level Crossing. Connington is near Peterborough in Cambridgeshire in the UK, by the way. Um, And the Level Crossing has a reputation as being the most atmospheric level crossing in Britain, which I do find as a strange combination of words. (laughs) Yes, it's also called the crossing of death. (laughs) Da-da-da-da. Yeah, and you'll see why. Because, very sad, of course, um, but, yeah, level crossing, back in the day, was on a narrow road, and it was opened by... The users of the crossing, no technology available then, as there was brought in in about 1970 to make it more safe, because there was quite a lot of close calls, despite warning signs, which people obviously didn't really take any notice of, as happens. But anyway, so there's two, well, there's two situations of fatalities there, and both of them have resulted in supposedly hauntings. The first was a colonel... Mellows. And he was heading home with his friend, Mr. Percival. Oh, and his dog. And maybe his friend was his dog, whose name was Mr. Percival. Mm, no, no, no. no. Okay. The, well, the, the, the dog was Colonel Mellows' dog. Yeah. OK. Here's Colonel Mellows' story as a ghost in his own words, which just mm. adds a bit of... Mystery. Oof. Yes. So, he says, We were coming back from an enjoyable day's shooting. My trusty Labrador was in the back of the car. We reached the crossing and got out. I saw the train standing on the south side of the crossing and said to Mr Percival, that's his friend, that it must be the 4pm train to London. He opened the gate and I eased the car across the railway track. I didn't see the train coming from the opposite direction and it ploughed into the car. My dog and I were killed instantly. I should have known better. Reason being, only seven months before, six German prisoners of war had been killed when the lorry they were travelling in was hit by a light engine. He goes on, I was buried in full honours and my dog was buried beside the railway track. My ghostly figure still drives up to the crossing and opens the gates, hoping this time for a safe journey. Very few people are brave enough to visit this haunted spot. But if you are, you might see me. And the other incident he refers to was in the Second World War. Um, It was after the Second World War, wasn't it? Well, there were prisons of war. Yes. Um, They obviously didn't let them go home too soon. No, well, that happened, didn't they? Um, They were all in a lorry and they were heading off to farms where they were obviously involved in doing some work. And... um, 
same sort of thing. They 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 thought the um, rail was clear. Light engine came along, hit the lorry, full on. Three people were fatally injured, um, but three were killed instantly. Um, it was a foggy day, and vis- visibility was down to about fifteen yards. So you can well imagine how that did mm. happen. Then the lorry carrying the injured men was in collision with a bus near the accident. Mm. So, yes, mm, the crossing of death and atmospheric crossing, you can well understand why. And apparently there are hauntings from the German prisoners of war who died there. Yes. So, yeah, not possibly a good place to go. It's out on the fens, apparently, which Mm. I always find is quite spooky. You know, you get the mists rolling along, it's very flat and it's not much habitation. So, yeah could be quite a spooky place. And the anniversary of that haunting again? Well, 16th of October. 16th of October. Mm. Thank you very much. Oh, welcome. And it's my great pleasure to be talking once again to Naomi of Inanna's Magical Gifts in Norwich. And today we're going to talk about Maybon, or the Autumnal Equinox. Now, is this something we should be sad about because the winter's coming, or is it a source for joy? You know, that's that's really what I think is most interesting about this festival. And I think there is such a duality about it. We are looking at two sides. We're looking at the closing of the summer... And the beginning of the winter, we're looking at the letting go of things and the bringing in. We're looking at the seeds being harvested and yet will be planted. So there is a degree of sadness about it, I think. And and I think that's not a bad thing in it, in itself. We can't always be joyous and merry and celebrating, but there is a lot to celebrate when you look at the harvest theme. What have you grown in your life this year? What is your harvest of gifts this year? What are your successes and what might be seeds of things that will rest in the earth until they germinate in the spring? But yes, there is loss. And I think many of the old myths, we can look at stories of Persephone, Proserpina, the first serpent, an ancient underworld goddess. And in many of the stories, she is taken against her will to the underworld. But in others, she realises that that is her queendom, that is her power. And her partner, Hades, is is a, a, a loving partner. And she is torn between spending time in daughterly role with her mother above earth and spending time in her queenly role and as partner um, below earth. And so we have to accept that winter will come. We have to accept that it will be cold and grey and flipping miserable. And yet we can find good things. So, yes, I I think there's a a, a curious combination of, of joy and grief at harvest, it seems like so much is going to go. Warmth and goldenness and light is fading and dusk is coming earlier. And yet I think there's great power and beauty and magic in all of that too. The sound of geese in the dark as they fly above you, knowing you know they're going south. The sounds of crunching of first frosts and leaves underfoot. Um, even sounds of autumn rain and howling wind. If you're warm and snug, you can enjoy them. Um, I think it is a, a, a season, this harvest season, that starts with such uh, pleasure with all the fruits and nuts and berries and seeds and colour, and then we see all the colour kind of fading out. And by the end of it, we just have the earth. We just have the earth and what's hidden below, what's concealed within and that the colour has drained and we're left with the starkness of whites and blacks and greys. And and that's why at midwinter, of course, the joy of red berries. Mm -hmm. 
is such a, a pleasure and the things that are evergreen become more special. So I think it's a, it's a heightening of sensory everything at this time of year. There's so much that surrounds us. But then it can also be quiet and alone and a time to think about sorrow and a time to think about change. I was talking the other day to uh, parents who were dropping off a child at university mm -hmm. and thinking, oh, it's the first time our child will not be with us, you know, on an mm. ongoing basis. It's a loss, but what is the gain? Their child is growing, their child is learning, their child is finding their freedom and expressing their individuality and learning new things. And we'll come home and visit and share. Yeah. But it was hard and they were really quite tearful. They'd just been down, you know, to the campus and yep. dropped off their beloved offspring and were feeling a bit bereft. But that's the way it is. And, you know, the excitement of small children who come in here and tell me, I've just started school, yes. and how excited they are. Well, you know, parents may shed a tear and, you know, think, oh, my little one is growing. Yes, but that's how it is. So, yeah, a mixture. Yeah, a mixture. <laughs> and, and what... Um, prayers or thoughts or ways of celebrating other of Mabel? Because, I mean, it's quite a new festival, isn't it? I mean, in terms of the name and everything. I think you're right about the name. Mabon or Mabon is, is not, it would seem, uh, from what I understand, particularly historical. Uh, 1970s, uh, a writer in America... Um, Aidan Kelly, I think it was, um, created a seasonal calendar, knew that there were old names for other festivals, was a bit disappointed that there wasn't one for Autumn Equinox, looked through the Mabinogion, found the story of Mabon and thought there were some useful ideas and decided to call it the Festival of Mabon and lots of people have done so since, but not everybody. So I would still say autumnal equinox, more than I might say Mabon. But ways of celebrating, and the fact that it is a celebration, I think will go back to the dawn of agricultural humanity, and that the process of gathering in harvest and knowing that you're laying in your stores to keep you all, your community, fed and nourished through winter, I would imagine harvest is one of the oldest festivals, mm -hmm. really, um, for that reason. What, what more important is there than supplies? Yes. Um, so the gathering in of those supplies that you've worked so hard to, to grow... And the, all the rituals of harvest, of, of cutting of sheaves and uh, making of celebrations and libations. Countless books will share you all sorts of folklore and traditions from all over the country about what happens with the last stook of corn or the last sheaf of wheat or the last uh, apples that are gathered or the last nuts that are shaken from the tree. And when you know that it's all gathered in, and of course, that does take us all the way round to Samhain at the end of October. There are celebrations. But certainly as far as kind of grains and fruits that are being harvested now and nuts, all of those things can be part of delicious yes. <laughs> celebrations. Some fermented and yes. others perhaps <laughs> fresh. <laughs> so, yes, uh, lots of things with cider, lots of things with beer, um, uh, all, of course, involving uh, the drinking of copious amounts of things, no doubt. But think of the colours of it. Um, Persephone, Persephone, uh, associated with pomegranate. Mm -hmm. um, it was in one of the myths that she chose to eat half a dozen pomegranate seeds and that those meant that she could never fully leave the underworld but must return uh, a month for each of the seeds. So half the year land... Yeah fallow, half the year, land fruitful. Um, 
be that as it may, the stories vary. Uh, certainly nothing more delicious and nutritious than pomegranates and pomegranate juice. Um, apples you can do so much with, whether you bake them, whether you slice them, whether you bob them, whatever you do, apples are good. And we know there's so much nourishing stuff in apples. Nuts, I mean, we're looking at high protein things. We're looking at sugar, storing of energy things. Um, and of course, everything you can do with grain. Um, I mean, I could do a three hour talk just <laughs> on grain rituals and grain celebration and the honoring of that and everything from its first sprouting, where of course it has massive more protein than just as a dried seed to uh, the alcohol that you can make with it. Uh, even the humble potato you can make so many delicious things with. And so yes, harvests of all kinds, particularly if you've grown it yourself, lovely, whether it's a few herbs in a, pl in a plot or a pot, or whether you've got a full scale allotment or a massive great garden full of lovely things. Even if you are just buying them on Norwich Market, you can still treat them as sacred things, sacred foods. I have my little Green Gage celebration for those few weeks that Green Gages are around and it's just a little golden honey flavoured ritual for myself when I get some local mm. Green Gages. Uh, at the moment my damson plum tree, the one tree that I've actually managed to grow in my very humble little tiny patch is dripping with huge great purple plums and they are so good and of course the temptation is to guzzle um, <laughs> and then you know all about it yes. so you have to ration yourself and I think that's the other thing we can have some plenty because we are very lucky here mm -hmm. and then we also have to think about stores and if you consider how it would have been even 50, 60 years ago, lots of preserving, mm. pickling, drying, salting, curing, putting things in syrups. Um, I remember as a child how my dad and I would uh, carefully wrap in old sheets of Radio Times and Observer Colour Supplement Bramley apples from two very elderly leaning over trees both long ago now, lent over and gone. gone. But yes. as a child, they were reasonably upright. And every year there'd be a great crop of Bramley apples. And we had big uh, baskets and boxes and we would layer them very carefully, making sure there were no bruises and no, mm -hmm. you know, potential to ruin it with yep. a, a rotting one. Whole nice apples and we'd wrap them in these sheets of paper. And I remember the, the crackle of the paper and the smell of these apples. And... All through the winter, my mum would be able to make apple sauces and apple cakes and apple crumbles and that flavour and that memory of us wrapping them up together and when we would get down to the last of the boxes and there wouldn't be much left, but we knew there'd be another, another summer and another apple harvest. So memory making, I think, can be done at this time of year. And I think that's something really valuable that individuals, families, anybody can create their own seasonal memories. So bring home some beautiful leaves, some nuts, some tree seeds, some berries. Find things that represent your harvest of your life, your learning of this year, your achievements and successes. And think, how has this helped you progress? What might you now have to let go of in order to progress? What are you sad about? What has happened? What could you plant as a seed? What could you return to the earth with thanks? What could you offer as a libation to the earth itself and its need for moisture and heat in the right doses and to think of the wildlife that we might sustain and look at any patch of green or garden that we might be near can it be made more of a home to any wildlife gorilla gardening i'm all in favor you know <laughs> plant something that butterflies and bees and birds and hedgehogs could enjoy and safely make a home in so i think there's all of those things all wrapped up together in a beautiful combination of harvest season.
Naomi. That was lovely. Thank you very much. You're so welcome. Thank you. You're listening to the Weird Tales radio show with Charles Christian. Bit of UFO news now. Now, uh, back in uh, 2017, the New York Times published a story about the apparent interaction between US Navy pilots and strange objects near San Diego. The first incident was way back in 2004 when pilots caught footage of an oblong object flying alongside their uh, planes. It was caught in the uh, plane's gun cameras and the object appeared dark against a bright daytime sky before, and I'm quoting here, suddenly and instantaneously accelerating to the left and out of view of the camera sensor at what appears to be an unprecedented velocity. And then there were a couple of uh, later instances, uh, both on the 21st of January 2015, uh, where similar objects were spotted. But what were they? Of course, the images were leaked and everybody was saying, oh, those are UFOs. Well, last week, to add to the mystery, uh, a spokesman for the Navy uh, from the uh, Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Information Warfare confirmed that these objects contained in the the objects contained in these videos were unidentified aerial phenomena. Um, UAP, unidentified aerial phenomena, is the phrase the government uses instead of UFOs, uh, as in unidentified flying objects. Now, this caused a lot of surprise because everybody thought, well, usually what they do is uh, they come out with some explanation that it was drones or uh, weather balloons or something of that nature. But no, these were UAPs. (laughs) Well, were they? Uh, Seth Shostak, who is an astronomer for the SETI organisation, that's the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute, uh, he said that just because the objects couldn't be identified didn't mean it was alien. And he points to the fact that all of these sightings were taken during a period when the US Navy was updating its heads-up display technology that was using um, basically the systems that uh, flash information across the pilot's eyes to give them the data. He says it seems to be um, more than a coincidence that the pilots had spotted these anomalies on their screens not long after they'd had software up. Dates. Yes, you've got it. Seth Shostak points out, as anybody who uses Microsoft products knows, whenever you upgrade any product, there's always problems. So um, that's it. Weren't UFOs? They weren't mysterious objects. They were just basically glitches on the software. Little software bogies flashing across the screen. Who thinks that will not stop the rumours that actually they really were aliens? Classic example of, well, they would say that, wouldn't they? Americana music lovers, we have something special from the UK. Join Charles Christian on his weekly Americana music radio show. He'll be showcasing the Now, the 26th of September is St. Cyprian's Day, and we have talked about him before. He's better known as St. Cyprian the Mage, and he's one of those semi-legendary saints that possibly lived or 
maybe was just a creation of everybody's imagination. Anyway, the legend goes he was a very powerful sorcerer back in the 4th century and uh, he saw the error of his ways when he was trying to seduce a fair Christian maiden on behalf of one of his clients and he changed over and became a Christian and later rose to be the Bishop of Antioch. Unfortunately, he fell foul of one of the uh, purges of Christians, the great persecutions that were going, and was martyred uh, for his faith. However, the legend of St. Cyprian lived on. It was said that although when he became a Christian, he destroyed all his old magical books, he did keep his own personal journals. And some several hundred years later, these appeared as the grimoire of St. Cyprian. And it's a particularly popular book for anybody practising folk magic in the Portugal Spanish area or the Portuguese and Spanish uh, speaking areas of South America, where St. Cyprian is still regarded as a valuable patron saint to call upon when you're practicing magic. Anyway, Janie's here and she's got a couple of spells that come out of St. Cyprian's grimoire. She's going to read them for us. Yes, I am. And what a little treasure trove they are for us ladies. <laughs> you know where I'm going to go with this, don't you? Right. First one. Magic of the orange tree flower. So, this is for when a girl has a great interest in marrying her boyfriend. And he has the habit of telling her to wait another year. So, what you should do is seek to steal a handkerchief of his, with great care, of course, so he doesn't realise you've done it. So right off, you're being sneaky, little madam, aren't you? Anyway, then, as soon as you go to church, you should soak the handkerchief in the baptismal fount, font, I should say. Ugh, I hope it's a clean one. Anyway, um, and immediately iron it? Well, yeah, hmm. I don't know how practical that is, but yeah. And you should say these words while breathing the vapour produced by the iron on the humid surface, which we hope is clean. So this is what you should be saying, so take some notes if you need to. Lustral water, thou who hast the virtue to make us Christians and open the way to heaven, make, insert name of your bow, Receive me as his wife in 100 sun's time. That's as in, you know, the big yellow shiny thing that's in the sky. So, three months or so. Let him give me as much trust as St. Joseph deposited in the Virgin Mary. Yeah. I deliver myself into his hands, ornated with the flowers with which I shall perfume this handkerchief he uses to clean the lips through which the holy wafer enters, which contains the body, blood, soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. After this is done, you should perfume the handkerchief with spirit of orange tree flower and place it back into his pocket in secret. And he won't notice, of course. He's now got a very smelly handkerchief that's all clean and was a tad grubby before it was filched. Anyway, so there you are. <laughs> That's, that's one. That's one. There's many more. There's many more. Including Magic of the Black Donkey, but I'm not doing that one today. <laughs> you have to hold your breath. Would you like another one? Yes, please. OK. Mm. I quite like this. I don't know what that says about me, but <laughs> draw a veil of it. It's called The Powerful Magic Ring. So... This is for every person who wishes to be idolised their whole life by people of the opposite gender to their own. Um, and they should do the following sorcery, which is attributed to St Cyprian. So, buy a ring with a small shiny jewel, have it removed and feed it to a crow at the stroke of midnight. Put 
the ring then on your pinky finger and keep it there until the crow expels the jewel through his natural excretion. So is this a pet crow? Or do you have to follow every crow around? Because <laughs> they do look broadly similar, let's they do. face it. They do, they do. Yeah. Um, and they live on the top of tall trees. They do. There's, there's, there's a few practical things here we need to address. Anyway, as soon as this happens, that's him excreting it, have the jewel put back into the ring and place it on your left hand finger while saying... By the power of God and by all the power thou and all thy jewel brothers have, that thou achieve everything in the world, for thy power is greater than that of God, I ask thee to make me achieve all I wish regarding love. Amen. And then you're to say, Pater Nostri, Ave Maria, and Salve Regina. So, as, as was said, whoever carries this ring, being a man and knowing how to present himself, i.e. not a total fool, will marry, marry the woman he most desires and will be able to possess even others that may awaken carnal desires in him. Hang on, I thought this was all about a woman. No, it's any person. OK. Um, yeah. Being a woman, she will achieve the same ends, but we cannot advise this use. Should they want to be respectable women... For this talisman makes its wearer very lustful. So it's all right for him, <laughs> but you, you as a female will be very lustful. Well, anyway, these are the instructions. I'm just quoting the grimoire. Hmm. There you go. Yes, it seems a bit grim for the poor woman yeah. that she's got to do all that chasing around, hunting down crow poo. Yes, uh, perhaps it's the works by a diversion, by you've time you've done that and spent several years chasing crows and picking up their poo and washing it out to see if there's a jewel in there, you probably think, oh, I can't really be bothered, to be honest. Yes. Get off to a nunnery. Yes. <laughs> I'll get a chihuahua instead. Yes. Anyway. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Now for that story about the unlucky mummy on the London Underground. I was going to call it Mind the Gap, but unless you've travelled on the London Underground, that reference may pass you by. Anyway, it's about the British Museum and it's an urban legend from early 20th century London. It's a curious story um, and it's gone on through the decades, becoming increasingly melodramatic with each retelling. As I say, it began in the early years of the 20th century and went on until really the Second World War pushed it out of the newspapers when real horrors became something to worry about. And uh, having said that, you'll still see it described as a true story, in some guides to haunted Britain. Indeed, when I was a child staying with uh, relatives of mine in Shepherd's Bush in London in the 1950s, they were all of the opinion it was true and they warned my parents to avoid Hoban Underground Station late at night. So let's start with the so-called facts of the story and then I'll tell you what really happened. The story starts in the 1880s when a tomb in Luxor in Egypt uh, dating back to about 950 BC, was being excavated. It apparently contained the mummy of an Egyptian princess called Armen Ra. Four young rich Englishmen visiting the dig site were so fascinated by the discovery that one of them purchased the mummy and its ornate wooden sarcophagus for several thousand pounds and had it delivered to his hotel. But... A few hours later, that man walked out into the desert and was never seen again. The following day, one of his companions was accidentally shot and had to have his arm amputated, 
As the two remaining men, they returned to England unharmed. However, one of them found his bank had failed and that he was financially ruined, while the other fell ill, lost his job and ended his days as a beggar selling matches on the streets of London. Clearly, Princess Armand Ra was unhappy that her tomb had been desecrated. One way or another, and the legend is a little vague here, but it's possibly the sister of one of the four men, uh, organised for the mummy of Armand Ra to reach England, where it was bought by a London businessman. However, after a series of incidents in which his house nearly burned down and three of his family were injured in a road, road accident, he became uh, convinced it was an unlucky uh, mummy and donated it to the British Museum. Worse was to follow. One of the workers helping unload the mummy at the museum broke his leg. A second soon afterwards died in mysterious circumstances and even the wagon delivering the mummy to the museum was involved in a road accident that resulted in a pedestrian being injured. Hope you're keeping track of the uh, death toll and the bad luck toll. It gets a lot higher as the story goes on. When the mummy was finally exhibited, museum night watchmen began reporting ghostly phenomena including the sounds of crying and hammering from within the sarcophagus. There were also tales of objects being thrown around the exhibit room, rather in the style of uh, poltergeists, and the mysterious deaths continued, including those of a night watchman and of a cheeky child visitor who had apparently thrown a handkerchief at the sarcophagus. Yeah, that'll teach you for being naughty. And then there was the photographer, who, following up on the story, by then circulating that the mummy was cursed, took a picture of the sarcophagus. However, when he developed the negatives in his dark room, they revealed images so horrifying. The face of a living Egyptian woman of malevolent aspect, that's a quote of the time, that he destroyed the negatives and then killed himself. Unnerved by all this, not surprisingly, the British Museum sold the mummy to an unnamed private collector uh, who kept it in a locked basement. But the bad luck continued. The man who supervised the relocation was found dead soon afterwards and one of his assistants fell severely ill. Later, the Russian occultist, Madame Helena Blavatsky, who uh, chronologically must have died, she died in 1891, not long after seeing the mummy, she visited the building where it was stored and declared she sensed an evil influence of incredible intensity. When asked if she could exercise the mummy, she apparently replied, it's a terrible accent coming up, There is no such thing as exorcism. Evil remains evil forever. Nothing can be done about it. I implore you to get rid of this evil as soon as possible. Years passed and the mummy was finally sold in 1912 to an American collector who arranged to have it shipped to New York on a brand new ocean liner. You're probably with me on this one now. Yes, it was the Titanic, which promptly sank on its maiden voyage on the 15th of April 1912 with a loss of 1,517 lives. But the story does not end there, as according to the legend, the American collector bribed members of the Titanic crew to place a sarcophagus in a lifeboat, and so it made its way safely to America. There its cursed travels continued, for it was first placed on another ocean liner, the RMS Empress of Ireland, which had the misfortune to be struck by a Norwegian freighter in, on the St. Lawrence Seaway in May 1914, where it sank with the loss of another 1,024 lives. Miraculously, the mummy survived again, and in a final bid to end the curse, in 1915, she was placed on another ocean liner to begin her journey back to Luxor in Egypt. The liner chosen was the RMS Lusitania, which sank with a loss of 1,198 passengers and crew when she was torpedoed by a German U-boat. 
this was during World War I, off the coast of Ireland on the 7th of May 1915. This time the physical remains of Princess Almond Ra went down with the ship, never to be seen again. But, once again, this is not the end of the story, for while the mummy may have gone, the angry spirit of Princess Armand Ra persisted, and by the early years of the 20th century, had begun making her way down the tunnel linking the British Museum to the then new, but now long defunct, British Museum Underground Station. There, it was said, travellers waiting for late-night tube trains could hear the anguish wailing of an unhappy ghost lamenting, presumably in ancient Egyptian, the fact her body had been lost and her tomb desecrated. You'll all be aware that the ancient Egyptians, uh, in their papyrus scrolls, such as the Book of the Dead, place great store on the preservation of the physical body as part of the ritual path to the afterlife. That's why they mummified them. The stories became so widespread that on several occasions Sir Wallace Budge, for many years the keeper of Egyptian and Assyrian antiquities at the British Museum, gave interviews to English and American newspapers, as well as writing an official disclaimer, explaining the legend was all a series of misunderstandings and that no mummy which ever did things of this kind was ever in the British Museum. But, as is often the case with tales like this, this denial merely fuelled rumours on the grounds that, if there was nothing to hide, the museum would not need to issue denials. As a result of the nearby and larger Hoban underground station being opened, the decision was made in 1933 to close the British Museum tube station. However, before it shut its gates for the final time, a national newspaper offered a cash reward for anyone willing to spend the night alone in the station. But nobody ever accepted the newspaper's challenge. More worrying still... Following the station's closure, there were reports the ghost of Princess Armin Ra had moved further up the tracks to haunt Hoban Station. This culminated in an incident in 1935 when apparently two women went missing from the platform at Hoban Station and were never seen again. Furthermore, the investigation into their disappearance uncovered, never described, I'm not quite sure how they can be described as never described if they were never described, but I'm being picky there. The investigation uncovered never described marks on the walls of the old British Museum station. Scratches of a bony hand, I'm guessing. So, it's an appalling saga. However, some judicious scratching quickly reveals there are elements of urban legend, fake news, publicity stunts and just plain fiction at work here. First, there was no group of English adventurers who came to grief in Egypt in the 1880s and the first account of the so-called unlucky mummy was of it originating in Thebes, not Luxor, and being donated to the British Museum by a Mr Arthur Wheeler in 1889. It was given the catalogue entry of 22542 and there, with the exception of being moved to safe storage during the two world wars and taken on overseas tours to Australia in 1990 and Taiwan in 2007, there it has remained ever since. It most certainly did not go down with the Titanic nor any other ship. Indeed, it's worth noting that the detailed inventories that still exist for the cargo carried by the Titanic make no mention of any mummy. But could it have been smuggled aboard the Titanic? Possibly, but there are no accounts by survivors of sharing a lifeboat with an Egyptian mummy, nor of anyone taking that mummy on board the Carpathia, which was the first rescue ship to the scene. And um, it's probably fair to say that if you were in a lifeboat, 
following the sinking of the Titanic and sharing it with a mummy, you'd have probably noticed it. It wouldn't be an experience you'd easily forget and you know, tales would be told. But what about the vengeful spirit haunting the London underground network? In fact, there never was a tunnel linking the museum to the British Museum station. If there had been, then during the Second World War, the British Museum would have surely stored its valuable artefacts there, rather than gone to the trouble of shipping them all the way down the road to the Oldwich Underground Station. As for the newspaper challenge to spend the night alone in the tube station, I had been unable to discover the name of the newspaper that did this, which tends to suggest it was an urban legend. And it's the same with the tale of the two women who apparently went missing in 1935. Why are there no reports of their names? And surely if they had disappeared, there would be, have you seen these two women? But nothing to be found anywhere. More pertinently, it seems a convenient coincidence that the women went missing the same night that the movie Bulldog Jack, or alias Bulldog Drummond in the US, opened in London, a movie which saw most of its action set on the London Underground, and even included a station with a secret tunnel leading to the British Museum. So was it all just a newspaper publicity stunt linked to the movie? In fact, it does seem that this movie is responsible for starting the rumours that was a secret tunnel between the British Museum and the underground system. As for Madame Blavatsky's encounter with the mummy, there is no reference in her papers to such an incident. And while we're on the subject of the mummy, she was not the Princess Armand Ra, although the inscriptions on the coffin lid, she was a priestess of the Egyptian god Amun, sometimes called Armen Ra. However, rather more importantly, there never was a mummy. The exhibit in the British Museum is, and always has been, just a mummy board. In other words, the highly decorated inner coffin lid from a sarcophagus, which, presumably along with the mummified body it once contained, still remains buried or lost somewhere in the sands of the Egyptian desert. All of which prompts the question, how or why did this story first arise? Now there actually was an incident way back in 1838 when the schooner the Beatrice, shipping an Egyptian relic known as the Menkare sarcophagus from Egypt to England, sank with all hands somewhere off the coast of Spain. And uh, then there was the case of the English writer Bertram Fletcher Robinson, who was researching the history of the artefact while working as a journalist for the Daily Express newspaper in 1904. He became convinced, or perhaps obsessed, that the so-called unlucky mummy had malevolent powers, and he died three years later at the relatively young age of 36. However, the main source for the legend is the English writer and spiritualist W. T. Stead and his friend, an amateur archaeologist called Douglas Murray. They claimed an acquaintance of theirs had bought a mummy in Egypt and placed it in the drawing room of their home in London. The next morning, every breakable item in the room had been smashed. The following night, the mummy was locked in a cupboard in an upper room, but with the same result although along with all the crockery there being smashed, apparently all the servants resigned en masse the following morning. At about the same time, Stead and Murray visited the British Museum to see the newly acquired mummy board, and decided its face depicted an expression of a soul in torment. It actually doesn't, but there was already a myth at that time that some ancient Egyptians were mummified while still alive. And so anyway, Stead and Murray asked to hold a seance in the museum. The British Museum 
possibly spotting that Stead and Murray were a couple of uh, publicity seekers, did not agree. However, the story was leaked to the press, or sold to the press, probably by Stead, who combined it with the tale of the crockery-smashing mummy, and so was born the legend of the unlucky mummy. There's an intriguing finale to this story, however, for 20 years later, W.T. Stead was amongst the many passengers who lost their lives when the Titanic sank. And according to a surviving passenger, Stead had been recounting the legend of the unlucky mummy the night before the liner hit the iceberg and sank. Mm -hmm. Anyway, you can see the unlucky mummy, but, as I've just mentioned, it is just a painted coffin lid in room 62 of the British Museum. And later, as you stand on the platform of the Hoban Underground Station waiting for a tube to arrive, don't be frightened if you hear an unearthly screeching sound coming from one of the tunnels. It is just the sound the tube train steel wheels make on railway tracks as the train corners and brakes. Or is it? Mind the gap. As anyone who's listened to this show before will know, we're great fans of the writer M.R. James, um, active between the uh, 1894 and 1927. That's Montague Rhodes James. And uh, we're always so fascinated by where he got some of his ideas from. For example, there's a story called Martin's Close, um, not one of his better known stories, but essentially it's Judge Jeffries, the notorious hanging judge, uh, conducting a trial in the 17th century. And it is the trial of a squire who has murdered a unwanted girlfriend, basically a simple maid he took advantage of and then uh, murdered. And the key part in the story is the fact that the murder, the people became aware of the murder when they saw the ghost of the girl hanging round the pool where she her body had been dumped. And it's all about the fact that there's a ghostly presence in the court and the uh, bringing out witnesses who say, I saw the ghost and it was terrible. So where did he get the idea from? Well, Here's a story that tells you all about it. And it's a proceedings of a trial in Durham, in the Durham area, in 1631. And there was, he's described as a yeoman of good estate and a widower uh, called Walker. And in his, one of his maids, one of his servants, was a young female relative called Anne Walker. And, and I'm quoting here from uh, my 1888 edition of Chambers' Book of Days. So the language is slightly prosaic. Anyway, the results of an amour which took place between Anne Walker and her employer caused Walker, the employer, to send away the poor girl under the care of one Mark Sharp, a collier, professedly that she might be taken care of as befitted her condition, but in reality that she might no more be troublesome to her lover in this world. In other words, he'd got her pregnant and wanted to get rid of her. Nothing was heard of her till... One night the following winter, an honest fuller by the name of James Graham, who lived about six miles from the Walker house, was coming down from the lower level of his mill and found a woman standing there with her hair hanging around her head and on which were five bloody wounds. According to the man's evidence in court, you can find the original deposition in the Bodleian Library in Oxford, according to the man's evidence, he asked her who she was and what she wanted, and when she gave an account of her sad fate, having been killed by Sharp on the moor in their journey and thrown into a coal pit hard by, while the instrument of her death, 
a pick had been hid under a bank along with Sharp's clothes which were stained with blood. She told him this and then demanded that he undertake the business of exposing her murder and having her murderers punished, a task he did not enter upon until she had twice more reappeared to him, the last time with a threatening aspect. And lo and behold, he told the authorities, and the body, the pick, and the bloody clothes were found just as the ghost had told James Graham they would be found. Walker and Sharp were arrested. They were tried at Durham before Judge Davenport in August 1631. And uh, the mode of discovery of the body could not fail in that age to make a great impression and produced much excitement at the trial. Hence, it is not very surprising to hear that one of the jury said he saw a child sitting on Walker's shoulder. That would be the ghost of the child that would have been born if he hadn't had the mother murdered. The men were found guilty, condemned and executed for their crime. As uh, sometimes happens, well, frequently happens, the truth is stranger than fiction. In fact, we ought to say that again with a bit of a spooky echo. The truth is stranger than fiction. That's it, we're out of time. One final thought before we go. While filming the movie Return of the Jedi, this is back in the nineteen back in the nineteen seventies, in the forests of the Pacific Northwest, actor Peter Mayhew, who was uh, seven foot two, was given strict instructions to never wander off into the woods in his Chewbacca costume. There was a concern somebody might shoot him, thinking he was Bigfoot. Yeah, it's a sort of rare creature and your first response is to kill it and have it stuffed. Ah, well, anyway, hope you've enjoyed the show. We'll be back same time next week. And until then, stay well, stay different. Black Shuck, the demon dog of East Anglia, is baying at the moon. Which means it's time for us to go. You've been listening to The Weird Tales Radio Show with Charles Christian, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, witchcraft, magic and folklore. You can keep in touch with us online at www.weirdtalesradio.com by email to weirdtales at icloud.com and on Twitter at Christian Uncut. Join us again next week for another edition of The Weird Tales Radio Show. Good night. This podcast is a part of Straight Up Strange Productions. Discover more shows like this one at straightupstrange.com.